Rob, good to meet you. We haven't actually, I don't think, done any face-to-face -face calls or anything. Yeah, man. Great to meet you. Glad to be here. Yeah, so um, Real Vision Crypto is is a platform that discusses cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology rather than just Bitcoin education, which is what you and me are more known for. And uh, so Real Vision viewers are mostly folks who've come in through the top of like a crypto funnel from the perspective of trading, not necessarily like the Bitcoin funnel from the perspective of saving or investing. And the Real Vision members are usually exposed to the ideologies of cryptocurrencies and tokens as like exciting cutting edge technologies or investment opportunities, disruptive financial uh, inventions, that sort of thing. And so these ideas are typically presented with you know, like a positive bias from the either the people involved with the, the the coins or fund managers who may be investing in these things or macro traders who are just typically not discussing it from like a skeptical viewpoint. And Rob, you're known for having like long philosophical conversations about value and truth in markets. And you have a deep philosophical framework of understanding why Bitcoin is important. So my goal with this conversation is one, let's bring Real Vision crypto audience through a strong logical framework of how to think about cryptocurrencies and discuss whether or not every token ends up competing with each other and with Bitcoin. And two, let's explore the network effects thesis and talk about whether or not anything that currently exists does have a chance of overcoming Bitcoin's network effects. So for people who aren't familiar with you, um, can you give a brief summary of your journey from coming into the space and uh, where you are now? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I've got a background in accounting and finance. Um, I started my career as a public, uh, certified public accountant, so CPA, doing mostly tax strategies for investment partnerships and high net worth individuals. I then branched out uh, on the entrepreneurial path. I was a career CFO, mostly focused in tech before starting my own consulting business in 2016. Uh, this was right around the time too that I started investing heavily into crypto. And 2017 was a bumper year, <laughs> to say the least. Market was up 1800%. Um, I became increasingly fascinated with the asset class and uh, launched a hedge fund in the space and, and consulting started to focus on that as well. And basically just going down uh, the Bitcoin rabbit hole in, in real time and in a professional and personal way. And so while operating the fund, my writing and talking about Bitcoin, history of money, economics, uh, even philosophy to some extent, which I think Bitcoin is sort of cultivating its own philosophy in a way. It's so the ramifications of this technology are so significant that it shakes up your worldview uh, in a very profound way. Uh, that all became much more popular. So, um, my most recent realization was 2020, which I guess was a wake up year for a lot of people. I just decided that I was, instead of spending all my blood, sweat and tears trying to outperform Bitcoin, which was the fun benchmark that I would focus on what was more meaningful to me, which is the reading, writing, talking about Bitcoin, uh, exploring you know, the, the show that I launched is called the What is Money Show. So we're, we're trying to ask these very fundamental questions that encourage people to think more deeply about life in general, but specifically socioeconomics and history and the systems within which they operate. And, um, and that's where I'm at today, just trying to help broaden Bitcoin education and philosophy. Well, you're definitely doing a good job. You were recently on... Lex Friedman's podcast. And I mean, how many views did that end up racking up? Probably, probably half a million or a million or more. A lot. Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, I think the YouTube had maybe in the ballpark of 300,000, but I don't know about his podcast numbers. Well, it's a very influential show and a lot of like, you know, congrats for getting on there and you did an awesome job. And, uh, you, you know, we only, we only have an hour today, so <laughs> I don't think we can go <laughs> through the full four hours of what makes everything valuable. <laughs> But let's try. I mean, let's see if we can do a 101. So you, you've previously said that inflation is theft and that Bitcoin is the, mo is the most superior monetary technology that has ever existed. Uh, eloquently put, I love it. Can, can you try to give like a 101 framework of thinking for why Bitcoin is the best form of money ra rather than just a, a, a really good macro trade? Sure. So 
we can start with inflation. Um, very ambiguous term, very misunderstood even by those who consider themselves adept in the sphere of finance. Um, instead of focusing on, you know, is it asset inflation, is it consumer price inflation, which gets into this arbitrariness of what do you categorize as, you know, CPI, how do you calculate it, et cetera. I just try to focus on fiat currency supply inflation. So you call it USM2 as a rough proxy for the dollar. I, I not only am, I don't think it's, a, it's not my opinion that inflation is theft. Inflation is theft, and I can prove it to you. Uh, there's no willing counterparty to an inflationary currency. Like given the option, anyone would choose a money that cannot be inflated, which is to say that it cannot be diluted. In the same way, you would choose uh, a guaranteed, you know, an undilutable stock certificate, for instance. You want a guaranteed fraction of the total pool of capital you are investing into. So inflation most certainly is theft. Uh, it is only possible, specifically fiat currency supply inflation is only possible via a legal monopoly, which presupposes coercion. Um, so that's inflation in a bucket. Money, more generally, why I think Bitcoin is the most superior monetary technology the world's ever had. I think the first realization you have to have is that money has always been a technology. Everywhere and every when it's ever existed, it's been a tool. It's an implementation. Um, and as I've documented in a lot of my writing, people argue about this, but I've narrowed it down to five properties. The money needs to be divisible, durable, recognizable, portable, and scarce. Without getting into the detail of each of those, um, we could just say the most important property of money, what bootstraps it into existence and gives it a store value function is scarcity. Now, there will be arguments about scarcity because people think, oh, scarcity is not a, a function of supply, which is true. Scarcity is when demand exceeds supply. That's when that's what gives an economic good a price in the marketplace is that there are more bidders then there are uh, supply for the thing. So therefore, it has a price. Um, but the, the thing that's unique about money specifically and why it is always scarce is because money is a tool that can be traded for any other tool in the marketplace. Or to say that differently, it lays claim to capital. And because humans are socioeconomically unsatisfiable, Right, they they always want more. Money is someone's always going to want a bigger stick, right? <laughs> that's right. Money is a is the most apt tool for attaining that more because it is the most liquid asset. So, money is always scarce by definition. But what we ascribe or use as money changes um, based on how well it fulfills those properties. So. I've talked and written about this at length, so I'll try to make it quick. Monetary metals are the best, most divisible, durable, recognizable, portable, and scarce monetary technology historically. Of the monetary metals, gold was the most scarce, which is to say that it was the most resistant to inflation. So it was the best store of value of all the monetary metals, which themselves were the best monetary technologies of the time. So this gave this supply and flexibility of gold or its inflation resistance is what gave it a store of value property across time. The problem with gold, the technological limitation of gold is that it suffered in the domain of portability and that it's, it's heavy, it's physical, it's expensive to secure. It's, uh, there are risks associated with physical settlement. It's difficult to move across space. Um, for these reasons, a warehousing function developed in the marketplace where custodians would take gold on receipt. They would issue warehouse receipts, paper certificates that were redeemable for gold in exchange for custodying the gold. And then market actors were free to trade with these paper certificates that were as good as gold because indeed they were a call option uh, on the gold custodied. So that was introduced. 
as an augmentation for gold as a technology. Gold was great for holding value across time, not so much across space. Paper currencies fixed that, but they introduced the risk of trusting the custodian. And that custodian over time has become the bank, which has become the central bank, um, which has always violated the relationship between the number of certificates issued to the gold reserves, the gold held on reserve rather. And then, you know, historically it's been broken time and time again, whether it was coin clipping today, um, it, you know, it started out as fractional reserve. We're now in the zero reserve banking system called fiat currency since 1971. So I guess if you zoom out and you just say money, one of the definitions, and there are many definitions of money, is a tool for expressing value across space and time, economic value. Gold is great for moving value across time, but not space. Paper currencies augmented gold to make it great for moving value across space. But because of the risk it introduced and the custodial risk, the counterparty risk, uh, they've proven not so good at storing value across time, especially fiat currency. And Bitcoin is something that is optimized essentially for holding value or moving, expressing value, excuse me, across both space and time. And that it's pure digital information. You can move it at the speed of light. You can store it in any information bearing medium. And because it maintains a perfectly fixed supply of 21 million, it optimizes for the store value function across time as well. So yeah, that's a that's a great five to ten minute um, kind of summation of of, of of everything from what what they used to use as money in ancient times to now we have Bitcoin. It's the gold for the technology era, mm-hmm. and then the, the so so that brings us to like crypto, right? Because if you can apply that logical framework of thinking that Bitcoin is optimized for transferring or storing value across space and time, and it enforces this uh, scarcity policy using code, then a lot of the new investors that we were talking about earlier, they will kind of come and think, okay, well, Bitcoin's up, but I missed it. So there's DeFi tokens and there's cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, and then there's Ripple and Mm. all these other things. So I would like to talk about how those things can hold up against that same scrutiny or if, or if they can, because a lot of these new traders and investors, they, they come in through the crypto funnel, right? And they, they not through the Bitcoin education funnel. Right. Uh, Yeah, that's a great point. And I guess it maybe it's important to, you know, I hit those five properties of money. I think one other important realization is that Bitcoin has essentially perfected those properties just by virtue of being the first digitally, absolutely scarce token. Um, So that's one important point is that Satoshi created Bitcoin in a way that perfected the properties of money in a tool like we've never seen before. So it's not like there's a lot of design space left. You know, you can't make, just for we'll zero in on portability, for instance. Bitcoin is digital. It's just information. You can move it at the speed of light. You can't get much faster than that, right? You can't make Bitcoin much more portable than that. Now, people would argue with you about, oh, the transaction speeds, and you need to settle it on chain, et cetera, et cetera. But that gets into this domain of trade-offs where to settle on chain, you're settling with finality. So that it's necessarily a slow, somewhat cumbersome consensus process because you're getting the assurances of final settlement. So when something like an XRP comes on the scene and says, oh, we can beam this thing around the world faster, we don't need six confirmations on chain, you're not getting any advantage there. There's no finality of settlement with XRP. It's it's controlled for reasons we'll get into. But so with Bitcoin, it's perfected the properties of money. And then on the scarcity piece, as I've argued in some of my writing, it's a one-time discovery, in my opinion, of absolute scarcity. So it's the only money in history with a provable, guaranteed 0% terminal inflation rate. And again, if you consider that with money, there is no willing counterparty to an inflationary currency. We only use US dollars and tolerate inflation 
at the tip of a gun, basically, or, or under the threat of the tax man, right. threat of force, whatever you want to call it. You would never voluntarily adopt an inflationary currency. So Bitcoin has optimized this property um, of monetary scarcity in a way that all market actors, in my opinion, at every level, will ultimately be forced to adopt it. Um, to get into the difference between Bitcoin and alts is that one is a bit of a nuanced topic, but the topic of path dependence, which essentially means that the sequence of events matters to the outcome and you can't rerun a sequence of events. So when Bitcoin emerged in the world, it was a one of a kind technology um, for a number of reasons. You know, it was written off. It was considered a joke for years. It was given this time to grow organically for its mining network to proliferate, for its code to ossify, for its bugs to get worked out. Um, and that the first mover advantage of Bitcoin is basically insulated by the network effects of money. So no alt can do that. No alt can have this one time path dependent emergence like Bitcoin. And e so Properties of money are perfected by Bitcoin. You can't repeat path dependence. So we have to accept that. But even if we would assume, just hypothetically, that some alt could prove, could discover a market proven property of money or feature that Bitcoin did not have and was wildly successful in the marketplace, we have to acknowledge that Bitcoin is still just open source code. It retains the ability to adapt features that may be useful to it. But due to the government governance asymmetry and its network, it resists harmful changes. This is something that's very complicated, I think, for people to understand. Because I always think, oh, can't Bitcoin just get hacked? Or can't the coders just change it? Or they control it? The rules themselves are basically ossified around the self-interest of network participants. So it's, it's Darwinian in a sense, that preserves the 21 million. Sure, you could go and vote to dilute the supply to 42 or 68 or whatever it may be, but no actor has an incentive to do that. They have an incentive to maintain the existing rule set. Um, so you could say that alts are basically copy, paste, modify of Bitcoin's code. They've either copied and pasted it, modified it, and are trying to compete directly with it as money, which I think is just a non-starter for reasons we've already laid out. Or some of these alts are using Bitcoin's code to try and address other market, market niches. And, you know, maximalists would argue here that the need for a token on any project for any market use case is completely extraneous. You don't need it whatsoever. If you need distributed consensus in any form, it should be built on top of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the only distributed consensus network that gives you assurance of final settlement. So that uh, that's a complicated argument. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we will be in a multi-chain world or not. And I think that you know what, where we're at today. Clearly, we are. I'm not sure how long it will persist. Uh, I do think that logically we have full consolidation at the base layer. So that's into Bitcoin with all of this alt experimentation actually being pushed onto higher layers of Bitcoin. That's the logical sequence of events to me. But humans are not always logical. And the other thing that plays into this is the more we inflate the fiat currency supply, the more we're forcing market actors further out along the risk curve, the more proclivity there is for gambling, basically. And we, you look at a history of money, every time you break the money supply, there emerges this class of, of gamblers. Um, and it also drives capital misallocation. Mm -hmm. So if nothing else, alts can have a use case for that, just a use case for flat out gambling. Um, and or misallocating capital, if you want to call it a use case. <laughs> but it's, I think that. Um... Well, a common narrative that I hear from people, and you probably hear this too, Rob, it's like mm -hmm. anybody that's coming in now that doesn't have that deep understanding of what made Bitcoin valuable in the first place mm -hmm. and 
and and the sequence of events like you described that is a once in a species event to allow an invention like bitcoin to become a money <laughs> to mm-hmm. where it's a trillion dollar market cap they are coming in now and they're getting kind of like educated through youtube videos and stuff and they're and they're getting um sold these like technology narratives and yes they, a lot of people fall for that like oh well, bitcoin is great and all they finally get that they go down the rabbit hole of, of accepting that cryptocurrency is real and that bitcoin can have value and then they start focusing on things like oh well bitcoin's old technology it's boomer coin it doesn't have a use case beyond digital gold so imagine a lot of the real vision viewers watching this video probably have subscribed to to a sort of similar thesis because of the this kinds of content that's prevalent in this 2021 mania that happened and they might yes. think that bitcoin might be flipped by some next gen technology or something mm. that unlocks new use cases like NFTs or lending or DeFi or whatever. So if you got a friend coming to you with this stuff, like an entrepreneur friend or manager friend, how do you typically like advise them to to like learn more about why this stuff is valuable or or like how do you advise them to be careful with the alt stuff? Yeah, just to put a cap on the last point, I think the useful distinction for me is to classify alts as liquid venture capital subjected to little, if any, due diligence, right? You and I can go launch Brad coin right now, 15 minutes on Ethereum. No, you know, there's no very low hurdles to entry, let's say. So in that very noisy, very scammy, very um, uncertain space, maybe there is something that works out at some point. I'm not, I don't claim to have the final answer to that, but I will say that whatever if the numbers on venture capital are, you know, one in a hundred projects are a unicorn, maybe nine or break even and 90 or failures, something like that. I would multiply that by a hundred in the alt space. So it's probably, you know, a much even more rare to find a winner if there will even be a winner. I don't think it's been determined yet that there is a viable alternative use case for distributed consensus outside of distributed cash at this point. You know, you could make some arguments for Ethereum, perhaps at the margins, but I, I don't, I don't buy it yet. Well, okay. So talking about Ethereum, it's kind of related. So Ralpal likes to talk about network effects on, on real vision. And lots of people like to talk about that. Metcalf's law specifically is, is one important network effect that, that does apply to Bitcoin and it's one of many network effects that make Bitcoin valuable. It's not just network effects like Metcalf's law or the nodes or um, the liquidity. There's all kinds of network effects that kind of like are pillars in this in this understanding of why Bitcoin is so valuable. But some of the cryptocurrencies do get significant network effects like mm-hmm. Ethereum. I mean, <laughs> It's hard not to acknowledge the network effects that Ethereum has actually grown over the last four, well, specifically two years. And then the people who look at this stuff mostly as technology will then look at the growth of the like the DeFi wallets or whatever and think, well, I guess because the DeFi TVL is going up because hedge funds and stuff are putting billions of dollars locked into DeFi, that must mean that the price of Ethereum is going to go up because it's got one of those network effects that made Bitcoin valuable. So do, do you think that this this like macro thesis of network effects from like, you know, people like Mark Cuban and stuff like that, um, that think that ETH is going to follow Bitcoin to reserve currency status and maybe eventually overtake Bitcoin's market cap? <laughs> do you think that has any legs or? Um, most certainly not. I, you know, competing with Bitcoin as money is a fool's errand, in my opinion, but Again, to distinguish these two sides of the universe, call it the crypto asset universe. And I have a, a pinned thread about this on my Twitter profile. Again, we say alts are basically liquid venture capital subjected to little, if any, due diligence. I consider Bitcoin, and this is where there's a fundamental misunderstanding, I think, by a lot of people when they say, oh, Ethereum might knock off Bitcoin or some, it's old tech, new tech could knock it off. Bitcoin is not an application. Bitcoin is not a business. It is not something that's easily disruptable. Like, you know, the the analogy Ray Dalio liked to use was maybe Bitcoin is the BlackBerry and Ethereum is the iPhone, something like that. So he's uh, 
it has this false equivalence between Bitcoin and a consumer product in that, in that case. Bitcoin is the internet. It is an internet protocol that has been conjoined right on top of the existing stack of internet protocols that we all know and use today. Um, you know, HTTP, TCP IP, this stack of open source protocols called the Internet Protocol Suite was assembled in the free market. It's ossified to the point where there's no one that really controls it, no one that can really disrupt it. It's just become this standard norm for internet-based interaction. And it allows you to move information around the world without permission, effectively. Um, and I think the way I look at Bitcoin is that it's just an interlocking layer right on top of the internet protocol suite that does the same thing the internet did for information for economic value. So we now have a permissionless economic value layer to the internet itself. And you only get one of those. So it's a, a protocol, which is, you know, even in language, we have certain protocols, like, you know, when to stop and let me speak, I know when to stop and let you speak. There's certain intonations, there's nonverbal cues. There are things that none of us singularly control, no government designates or business designates, this is how we're going to talk. And this is, uh, this is the protocol of, of spoken speech. And in the same way, the internet developed along a similar path. And I think Bitcoin is just the next evolution of the internet. It is it's one and the same with the internet. So that's the fundamental, I think that analogy gives you the best framing of the difference. It's like to understand something that is internet based versus something that is an internet application. Um, another analogy here might be useful. So in the mid nineties, when the internet was first emerging, there was a lot of talk by corporations that they didn't need the internet they were just going to have their own intranet, right? They would, they would self-host all of these things and have their own internal development environments and communication portals, et cetera, et cetera. They don't need the internet. But what happened is that the open source nature of the internet rapidly and radically outcompeted all intranets. And this is based on a very simple energetic principle, actually, in that this is what the developmental psychologist Piaget, he wrote about this 150 years ago, I think, maybe, maybe 100, what he called equilibriated versus disequilibriated structures. So in a equilibriated structure or game, the rules are voluntarily adopted. So everyone comes to play the game based on their own self-interest, right? You don't need to enforce the rules. People have willingly accepted them. It's a, a consensus based on uh, mutuality, I guess you might say, or as a disequilibrated structure or game is one in where the rules are enforced, are imposed. And that disequilibrated structure requires an expenditure of energy to protect their turf, secure their borders, enforce their rules that the equilibrated game does not incur, does not incur these costs. So it's for that reason, like this very fundamental reason that open source networks outcompete closed source networks. And I think that's what you saw with the internet outcompeting intranets. That's what you're going to see with Bitcoin outcompeting closed source fiat currencies. And this distinguishes altcoins because at the end of the day, there is someone or some group or some entity that can heavily influence the rules, the governance, the community the supply, whatever it is, there's, there are singular interests and agendas that can influence um, these key components of an altcoin that is not the case for Bitcoin or internet protocols more generally. Nobody can go and um, you know, arbitrarily change the, the, the rules of Bitcoin. So that really gets to the fundamental value proposition and that Bitcoin is this apolitical, unchangeable, um, asset that is agnostic of human affairs and politics. And again, if you look at the history of money, <laughs> politics always pursues control over the money because that gives you control over the armed forces and that gives you control over people. So Bitcoin as an asset that cannot be controlled is actually a pathway for humanity to save 
himself from himself in a lot of ways. Um, and this gets into the deeper philosophical aspects, but the key point there is just that Bitcoin's the only asset in the world that nobody can control. Um, gold was sort of that before, but now gold has even been commandeered by central banks. So I, I love that. I think that's a really good way of, I mean, if you're thinking deeply about this stuff, you want to really pay attention to the, that, the decentralization and the fact that we fought a civil war in Bitcoin over to control of the network and keeping it decentralized and not allowing anyone to have force or, or, uh, or on, you know, unwanted say and sway over the network. Yes. And, and most of us, most Bitcoiners think that altcoins are going to bleed into Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin is going to eventually, you know, when things become more rational, Bitcoin will, if it succeeds as at its mission, it will become in the maybe 10 trillion market cap or more because it's competing with gold as, store value and all these other assets. Mm. But I mean, there a lot of a lot of network effects are being built for other cryptocurrencies, whether it's incentivized network effects because VCs are investing billions of dollars into stuff. It goes back to your point about nobody is there is no consensus for Bitcoin. There's no Andreessen Horowitz for Bitcoin. Mm. Yet Bitcoin is still gaining so much value and Lindy effect and network effects without a centralized authority yes. pushing it down the, you know, up the hill. Yeah. But, you know, a sailor said that uh, Ethereum was a shark duck that lived in trees. <laughs> and then recently he kind of took a more conciliatory approach to that. And he said, oh, well, there's enough room for Ethereum to take on Wall Street. So I've got a lot of cognitive dissonance about this 2021 market. I did mm. not think things were going to play out like this. I thought we learned lessons in 2018 and 19 mm. with all the ICOs. So you kind of answer this already, but over the next 10 years, do you think that, do you think that all of these forced network effects and incentivized growth and generalized mining and all these different things that all these foundations and venture capital firms are doing to pile money in and build network effects and simulate growth on cryptocurrencies. Do you think that's going to end up being a strong enough foundation for it to weather a global macro crash over the next 10 years, if one happens, or do, or do you think that the market will become rational and then this stuff is going to bleed to Bitcoin like Bitcoiners think? Well, again, this idea of the market becoming or being rational when the you know there's a global coordinated attack on currency, effectively, um, I, I again really encourage the audience. There's a, there's a, sh a short book. It's called Fiat Currency Inflation in France, and it's talking about the assignment issue. Um, I definitely mispronounced that. It's a French word. I think it's Assignon, where they had um, a major currency <laughs> debacle, let's say, and all of the things that happened culturally in France at that time. Uh, one of the main things was that people just started becoming much more prone to gambling, right? The markets got increasingly irrational as inflation progressed. So, we're just getting started with this post-COVID global monetary expansion. Um, oh no, we're just getting started. Yeah, I, I mean, don't know it, if I can handle that, man. So <laughs> the next ten to fifteen years, I think it's just going to be absolutely devastating um, on the currency, on those that don't understand what's happening, like those that really, you know, again, the economically vulnerable, people living on fixed income, the poor working class, people depending on currencies to hold their value are going to be most victimized uh, in this, this era. And you're already seeing it, right? We're already seeing these currency, these crises breaking out. We've got Lebanon um, having a lot of issues currently, and it, it's just going to spread. Um, I think that, th so the network effects of all, it's, I mean, they're real in the sense that if we define a network effect as a non-linear benefit of a new network participant joining to all the existing participants. So for Ethereum, every developer they get, it's actually increasing um, the value of the total developer network. So network effects are real. And I would say maybe that's what upholds a lot of the value of alts today, but they're not, the network effects of money are much different 
in the sense that money is the ultimate open source network, right? Like if you just if we use gold as the analogy, gold is valued the world over, right? And it's valued because everyone values it. And essentially what it represents is this monetary shelling point on those properties of money. So people that are seeking a way to store their wealth in something that's divisible, durable, recognizable, portable, scarce, they've the market has zeroed in on gold to best satisfy that those functions. Um Bitcoin being disruptive to gold, it's establishing a set of network effects that, you know, they're multi-sided. I've talked about this a little bit too, where, so if you have, if you consider a standard one-sided network effect, it could be something like the telephone or Facebook, where you just have one cohort of users, which are um, the people that own a telephone or the people that own, have a Facebook profile. There's also two-sided network effects. If you look at something like a two-sided market like eBay or Craigslist, where you have buyers and sellers adding incremental value to the network. And two-sided networks are more difficult to disrupt because an, a, an upstart network has to introduce a superior value prop for both buyers and sellers simultaneously to disrupt that network versus Facebook disrupting MySpace only had to break a one-sided network effect, right? Bitcoin as money, um, digital money specifically, is really unique because it has a four-sided network effect. So we've got uh, buyers, we've got sellers, we've got developers, and we have miners. And so to try and disrupt Bitcoin you would have to somehow simultaneously introduce a value proposition for all four cohorts. And you would also have to do it in a way that was not a hard fork of Bitcoin, that was not trying to take advantage of his network effects. Because if you went that route, as Bitcoin Cash did in 17, you you basically are forking the social contract. So as a Bitcoin holder, your optimal strategy is to just hold, right? You just hold both tokens and see which one succeeds. Now, Clearly, I'm not saying people do that. A lot of people dump their Bitcoin cash. But the point is that gives the network effects associated with Bitcoin a very inviolable network effect, if you will. It's very hard to break. So I don't think Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin is going to benefit wildly from this inflation. I think it's the ultimate, uh, I hate to call it a hedge against inflation because I think it's so much more than that, but it definitely is that. Uh, but these other, you know, these altcoins, again, if they're nothing more, let's just assume hy hypothetically that none of them ever realize any substantial use case uh, or, or, you know, find any real world utility. They could still have a lot of quote unquote value just as gambling devices, right? People pushing these narratives around, um, investing in them you know, based on pure speculation. So to get back to the, the question of how I would advise a friend, I tell people that the most conservative portfolio you can have in Bitcoin or in crypto, I guess you'd say is 100% Bitcoin, 0% altcoins. That's the most conservative position. That's the position I currently hold as well. I'm 100% Bitcoin. I hold nothing else. Uh, I just don't see any risk adjusted return in my mind that, that outweighs uh, what Bitcoin represents. And most people I tell that to, they start to look at you cross-eyed for all these reasons we've laid out. They're like, what do you mean? Bitcoin's <laughs> old tech, you know, what about this Ethereum thing? Or I read this cool white paper, or I've done all my homework, I've really studied this project, I know it's gonna be a big deal. You know, they really wanna fight for the narratives that they've been ingesting. And so I have a second answer. I'm like, okay, if you want to be very aggressive and assume you have to enter this with the assumption that your, your alt allocation position could all go to zero. I'd say the most aggressive you could ever be in crypto is 80% Bitcoin, 20% alts. And I advise against it. I don't think it's a good idea. I think I don't see where these, any of these tokens on a risk adjusted basis outperform Bitcoin whatsoever. I think a lot, most of them, the vast majority will go to zero. Um, but I've found that to be hopefully somewhat of a, a, a compromise 
for those that really want to hold on to the altcoin narratives because they are very. Do they listen to you though? Do they? Do they take entrance. your advice? I uh, mine don't. I, I guess the verdict is still out, right? <laughs> I tell the same thing to my friends, man. I'm like, yeah. I give them the the Pareto principle pitch. I'm like, listen, you're yes. you're a busy person. Usually, it's like a successful entrepreneur, or somebody that's coming to me saying, "Oh, I got some cash. I don't want to hold my cash anymore because right. look at what's happening with the world. I'm going to allocate into crypto." And yep. you've been in Bitcoin for so long. So what should I, what do you think I should do? And I tell them, listen, unless you want to become a full-time penny stock trader, a Forex trader, or crypto yep. trader, then you should just go 100% dollar cost average into Bitcoin. You're going to get the Pareto rule there, 20% of the effort with 80% of the results. Because yes. sure, you could probably, if you're really good, focus your energy, get alpha over Bitcoin by spending all your time being a <laughs> crypto trader. But it's really hard. And you know, just 20% of the effort, 80% of the results. Like you're going to get yeah. most of the gains of this entire market just being in Bitcoin. And it's the easiest thing to do and less stressful. Absolutely. And I would say even But if, still they go into Ripple and HBAR and all yeah, this other I crap, know. right? It's <laughs> it's the, you know, the, the age of the meme, I guess, in the digital landscape that people really get captivated by these things. Um, and I would take it a step further and say, even if they decided to be this full-time crypto slash penny stock trader, there's still a 99.9% .9 chance they're going to get destroyed by buying all Bitcoin. I mean, I've, I've worked with and talked to some of the best, the best fund managers in the world. Their benchmark is buy and hold Bitcoin. It's really hard to outperform buy and hold Bitcoin flat out. I mean, it, it sounds so almost too good to be true in a way. And we do sound perhaps a bit uh, overly zealous when we're like, listen, man, just buy and hold Bitcoin, ignore everything else. People start yeah, to think- use my referral oh, code. <laughs> yeah, what are your incentives? Well, clearly you hold Bitcoin, so that's why you think that. But it's like, it's actually the reverse. It's like, I hold Bitcoin because I think that, you know, it's- um, Raul Paul gave some really good advice last year. I remember in a video when right before COVID hit or right around when COVID hit, I was thinking about hedging my Bitcoin portfolio and I was thinking about buying some options because I didn't want to see a 50% drop in my net worth. I figured the COVID thing was going to hit all markets. Bitcoin was going to go down short term as well. And I was stressing out about it. So I was looking into options. And I remember watching one of the Real Vision videos where Raul answered the question from a viewer saying like, what's the best option strategy to take for a complete noob and his answer was don't like if you don't understand mm -hmm. what options right. are and it means you're over allocated to the asset class and you should probably just reduce your allocation get more comfortable and then once you're more comfortable you probably won't even feel like you need hedging strategies like option yeah. strategies and stuff yeah agreed um so it's just I, a, I think it's education probably absolutely i would say that um if you are a familiar comfortable understanding of options, that would be my preferred method for trying to outperform Bitcoin actually, versus trying to trade these shit coin currency pairs that, you know, you're basing that on nothing or you could, you could base it on charting, I suppose, but it was very, very uh, low utility in, in the crypto space. But if you're trading options and you're mapping that onto, you know, your short to medium term price, predictions based on whatever fundamentals you're looking at. I think I've found that to be a much more viable strategy for generating Bitcoin alpha, but I still recommend against it. Like if you have to do it, that's what I would do, but you need to be someone that's, uh, that's really good at it. Another thing too, about being in the altcoins and trying to outperform Bitcoin gains is a misconception about diversification. A lot mm -hmm. of people think that if yes. if they're going to be in this thing, well, I missed Bitcoin, I'm going to go into this or that because of the technology narratives, because of right. the network effects, whatever it is. And they start thinking, well, I should diversify in my normal portfolio. So I guess I'll diversify in crypto. I'm not going to just right. have Bitcoin. But that's like a real estate investor going and looking at the neighborhood and saying, oh, I'm going to buy a single story home and a blue house and a, a, right. a double story pink house and I'm diversified. It's like well, yeah. everything is correlated to Bitcoin. We've seen when Bitcoin goes down, the altcoins get wrecked. And when yeah. Bitcoin goes up, that opens up the door to the speculation that yes. you're referring to because the Federal Reserve is keeping interest rates low and pushing people out on the risk curve, encouraging 
kind of this degenerate behavior of just gambling yes. on meme coins and meme stocks and all this stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if you got any thoughts on that about the correlation. Yeah. Well, no, it's a great point that we're where the the perception of the Bitcoin world it sort of gets hurt by the perceptions people bring from traditional markets, right? They think, oh, I need to diversify, right? That's kind of like risk management 101 in traditional markets is diversification. But in crypto assets, it's really a bad idea. That's why I try to draw this bright line between Bitcoin as the internet and altcoins as this uh, venture capital. Uh, the other one was disruption, as we alluded to earlier. Clearly, this is digital technology. We've become accustomed to thinking the digital landscape is so prone to disruption. So people think, oh, it's Bitcoin today, and maybe tomorrow it's Ethereum, then it's Ethereum 2, 3, 4, whatever. Uh, but that's just not the case. And it betrays this deeper ignorance of a protocol. Like you have to actually understand what the internet is, what a protocol is, how they develop. So there's all of the these headwinds uh, to understanding. And I, I mean, I love Saylor's definition of diversification as selling the winners to buy the losers, right? Like part of the thing I did preparing for my, my long form interview with him was I read his book, The Mobile Wave, which was written in 2010. And the punchline in the book was go buy Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Amazon, Google, you know, all the FANG stocks and just hold those for the next 10 years. And he was, getting, he was making a very fundamental investment case about how they're radically altering the nature of markets and exchange and um, you know zero marginal cost of distribution, all of these things. But the, the punchline was very simple. The investment strategy was very simple and turns out, in hindsight, was definitely the best performing uh, strategy except for buy and hold Bitcoin <laughs> to the <laughs> yeah. first decade. Um, so the point there is like you, you're, and uh, I interviewed Pomp the other day. He was saying that some of the best performing investment strategies have been the guys that have died or lost their password. Where it's like, once you've made a very deep fundamental thesis, the best strategy is to just go and acquire the thing and wait. It's right. like education followed by patience. Those are the best investment strategies, but it's very counterintuitive because we as human beings feel like we always need to be active and trading and doing something about every piece of news that comes out, every price movement. But you have to, I, I mean, I try to encourage people to take a step back and understand that even if the market's irrational, it's still going to be smarter than you always by definition. You know, it's the collective intelligence of the world basically compressed into the into these price movements. Um, sure, you can beat it here and there, but the largest and most substantial gains are generated by developing deep conviction on an asset or assets, taking a position and holding such that that thesis can be expressed. I think it's important that Bitcoiners have conversations like this, talking about acknowledging the network effects, acknowledging the arguments for the altcoins. And because it's typically like, crypto twitter or wherever podcast it's typically like mm. if it's a bitcoiner it's like that's a shit coin i'm not going to talk about it or if you're a multi-coiner you're just pigeonholing bitcoin as just store of value and it's look at all these other technology coins or macro traders who are just thinking about it as the narratives and the trades but i mean bitcoin maximalists i think should be educated about the network effects and the technologies and stuff to have open conversations and you know everybody straw mans everybody if you don't have like long conversations so i see that all the mm -hmm. time on crypto twitter and stuff where the altcoiners will straw man bitcoiners as just bitcoin maxis mm -hmm. and then the and then the bitcoin maximalists will straw man the altcoiners as just like right you know gamblers or penny penny stock traders or scammers like you hear that a lot yeah. like oh you're just yeah. a scammer right right so it's good that we have this conversation because there's a bunch of new people probably just come into 2021 thinking like, oh, these Bitcoin maximalists are, and they're just like, we're just straw man to, to be something that we're not. And um, yeah. I think that maximalists are misunderstood by crypto investors because B Bitcoin maximalists to me are more like financial activists, I feel like. Mm -hmm. 
of course I'm driven by like the profit motive and I want to make gains and I also invest in seed companies and stuff like that. But like, mm -hmm. to me, Bitcoin is more than just, just making like moon returns, right? That's great. Mm -hmm. I like that, mm -hmm. but it's more than that. Do you think that most, most crypto people, two questions. Do you think that most crypto crypto folks that are coming in now into the space have a framework of thinking that more aligns with say like stock investing or, or something like that versus Austrian economic philosophical philosophical thinking about money, like that sort of thing. And how are how are you coming? You've got a, a like a thesis on on uh, freedom maximalists, right? Isn't it? Is it freedom maximalism? Yeah, that's right. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that whole topic for for the real vision viewers who might think that <laughs> <laughs> maxis and maxis are evil and like you know. Yeah. Well. Um... Well, so I guess first thing to say is don't believe everything you read on social media. <laughs> Twitter is very low bandwidth communication. So it seems like there's, there's so much lost in translation. I see people having these arguments. Um, it's a great tool. You know, it gives you a lot of reach. It's, this, it's got this asynchronous communication with a very broad audience. But you're just there's a trade-off to that, right? There's a trade-off to the reach that you're getting very diminished resolution, right? The, like you're, the subtleties that we have when we're conversing, the nonverbal, the, the protocol of language is largely lost in, in the Twitter sphere. And so that kind of distorts the communication itself. You know, people, already as humans, we have this tendency to label people that just helps us decomplexify the world. And it's an expedient to thought like, oh, that guy is it's a communist or a capitalist or a scammer or a shit coiner. You just put them in a bucket and you don't have to think about it anymore. Right. So you're taking you're talking it, about me. I'm just talking about how <laughs> just humans kidding. operate. <laughs> we consciously try to label one another. So we reduce this huge complexity that is a human being down into a single word, put them in a bucket and try not to think about it and move on. Right. So that, okay, great. There's a trade off there too. You get expedience of thought. You're like, okay, disregard his opinion. He's a socialist or whatever it may be, or, or consider his opinion more deeply because he's a capitalist. But that discounts the sovereignty of the individual actually, because humans are a lot more than the singular labels we give them. So if you start labeling a person and say, that's what this person is, you know, a lot of people have labeled Raul a shit coiner. They just say he's a shit coiner. So they'll make a bunch of ugly memes about him on Twitter and, you know, write off everything he says. Raul's an extremely smart guy. You know, he's, <laughs> maybe he shit coins, maybe he trades and does all these things, but that doesn't mean you can just throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. It's like, he's still a human being. So I guess the difference for me, and this is funny because I hold 100% Bitcoin. So on paper or on my portfolio construction, I am technically a Bitcoin maximalist. However, where I draw the line for me culturally is that I'll never proclaim to have all the answers. Because what I've found is the more I study, the more I learn, the more questions I have. It's like the more answers I get, the actually the more questions I have. So it's kind of like the old Socrates wisdom that the only thing I know is I know nothing at all. So I'm just trying to learn more and trying to be more humble in the face of all this radical change. And the other thing here is this, that the digital age is evolving exponentially, right? It's not, it's not just that things are faster than ever, but they're getting faster at a faster rate than ever before. So like you think you can't deal with the new information today, give it 10 years. It's going to be coming at you even faster. So in my mind, the only way to deal with that effectively is to try to constantly have a beginner's mindset and to exhibit extreme humility. I think humility becomes a better skill set, a more apt skill set for the conditions we're facing in the, in the onrushing future of the digital age than maybe in the 20th century uh, people tended to be a, a, a little bit more attitude, a little bit more, you know, force saying, I have the answers, propagandizing, all of these things. I think all that stuff's going out the window. So I think with, on the cultural side, Bitcoin maximalists just proclaim, often proclaim to have 
the answers, right? There are no more questions. You are a scammer, the end. Um, now, this is nuanced though. It's not black or white because Bitcoin maximalism serves a very distinct purpose. Anyone who tries to attack the core protocol rules of Bitcoin or to disturb uh, any of the elements contributing to its rock solid consensus, the Bitcoin maximalism is the cultural immune system, right? They are the white blood cells designed to identify that threat and expel them or destroy them. But just like, and this, this analogy is great because just like the biological immune system, it can also be overreactive and attack things that are either non-threatening or even beneficial sometimes. So you can have this autoimmune disease. And yeah, for me, I just don't, I, I observe and respect and acknowledge the purpose of a cultural immune system, what it need, its importance to Bitcoin, it is, it is of the utmost importance. It is vital to Bitcoin's existence, but that does not mean I don't. For me, I don't want to adopt toxicity as a cultural norm. That every time I have a disagreement right. with someone, I tell them to have fun staying poor. You're a shit coiner. You're a scammer. <laughs> it's like I believe in that Bitcoin's culture will evolve past that actually. And that having and engaging in open dialogue, even with people you don't agree with, is more important than you putting a label on them to dispel them. So it's complicated. It's not black and white. It's not clear cut, but... And it's evolving too, man. It, it's evolving. And the, the last You know, thing, Clubhouse, I, I, Clubhouse I, has been really good because people don't just tweet at you. They talk right. to you and you can you can feel some sort of like response, right? When you say Higher something resolution mean. Communication. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So the last thing I think about is this is when I look around the corner and I say, okay, my thesis is that Bitcoin is going to continue to outperform, continue to become a monetary standard, if not the monetary standard, over the next couple of decades, let's say. At the point that this protocol has ossified and become the norm, how relevant will toxicity be at that point? We don't have TCP IP maximalists, <laughs> toxic maximalists running around. We don't have HTTP toxic maximalists running around. Um, so I think that Although it serves an extremely vital purpose to like get the seed of Bitcoin out of the ground, you know, it's got to be very scrappy, very, um, it's just got to fight to get, to get its roots initially. As that trunk starts to develop and thicken, I think the toxicity of the culture offers diminishing returns. I so agree with that. That's why I'm trying to like sculpt myself and my career is toward that aim. I'm not saying we don't need toxicity. To get rid of it, people that want to be toxic maximalists, more power to you. I respect you. Go do your thing. I'm going to try and be at the outer edge of Bitcoin's cultural evolution. That's my aim. I agree with that. I think, I mean, we're at, we're at the hour mark here, so we're going to end it here. And uh, maybe we'll do another, another uh, talk with you again. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, maybe three, three or four months, we'll come back and revisit the altcoin discussion and the Bitcoin culture discussion, because there's a lot more to talk about there. Yeah. But let's end it on a positive note for people that want that like crypto people, right? Who, who may have thought, oh, Bitcoiners are just toxic maxis. Like maybe they got a bad perception of Bitcoiners because of some Twitter interactions or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Who are some people like yourself that you think are Bitcoin only influencers, Bitcoin educators, Bitcoiners that are like maximalist, I guess you'd say, but are like empathetic and like, yeah. you know, not, not toxic. Who are some non-toxic Bitcoiners that you suggest people go follow? <laughs> well, I don't want to speak on anyone's behalf. I don't know how they feel about their own personal toxicity, but I will name some people off the top of my head that I get a lot of value out of. Um, I already mentioned Michael Saylor. Probably everyone already follows him. Uh, VJ Boyapati. It's been great. Um, I would put safety in there as well. I'd say safety is a little more toxic, but I still think he's a great thinker. Uh, John Vallis, he runs a podcast in the Bitcoin space. That's great. Um, I think Gigi is a great thinker. He's a little bit more on the toxic side as well, but still, still a really good thinker in Bitcoin. Um, Dan Held, I think Dan's doing great work. Uh, he, 
he does a great job of doing what is like the too long uh, TLDR of Bitcoin in a way. He can explain it very simply. I think that's great for for new entrants. Um, Preston oh, Pish I, is a good one too. Preston Pish is amazing. You know, he's got a great macro background, very relatable. He's a super humble, straightforward guy. I'd put Jeff Booth in that bucket as well. Jeff's a very compassionate, super smart, philosophical guy. The Blue Matt, um, he's a great Twitter follow, Bitcoin core developer, works at Square Crypto. It? The Blue Matt, uh, Matt, Matt Corallo. Okay. Uh, that one's not ringing a bell for me, but... Um, he's a developer. He's got blue hair. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know that one. Uh, I'll leave it at that. And I, you yeah, know, that's a good list. For, forgive me if I if I left you off, but it was off the top of my head. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, Rob. Appreciate the conversation. I'm sure people got some value out of it. And if not, they can just troll us on Twitter. <laughs> that, that seems to be the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. All right.